in uh, Isaiah 54, 17. Here's what God's word says for us. Listen carefully. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Do any, does anybody in here, I asked this question of the, to the guys in jail the other night, and of course I've got an almost 100% response. Does anybody in here have any enemies? A few of us do. Some of us have multiples. The devil's our main one. He likes to attack us. He likes to trip us up. He likes for us to stumble and fall and not do the things that God has for us to do. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. That's what God says for us to do. We're to condemn those things that we know are wrong. We're not to sit there and just allow the devil or whoever it is to, to tell wrong things about us. This is a heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. I'd wondered about that. I'd seen where Elijah was righteous and different men in the Bible, different women in the Bible were righteous. And I wondered, how did they get their righteousness? Well, right here it tells us, didn't it, doesn't it? It says, God gives us our righteousness. It's from God. That's the only place we can get it. We cannot get righteousness by being good. By trying to do all the right things, by reading the Bible, by giving money, by doing the things that we know are right. We're not doing the things that we know are wrong, as we saw in the children's message. God wants us to be righteous. And the only place we can get righteousness is from God. He's the only place. He's the only one that has it. And if we don't get it there, where are we going to get it? We're, we're not going to get it. We're not going to have righteousness in ourselves. We do not have righteousness in ourselves. The Bible says, in me, in my flesh, is no good thing. Now some of you don't believe that, but it's true. It's God's word. In my flesh, there is no good thing. But in God... In Him, there is righteousness. And if we want righteousness, we have to go to Him. And if we want to have it, we have to take it from Him. He's the only place. He will always be the only place. I believe the Bible says every good gift and every perfect gift comes from where? Amen. It comes from our God. And we can have that. What did you say, brother? Amen. God wants us to be righteous. He wants us to have righteousness. He wants us to portray righteousness wherever we go. I was so glad. I'm always discovering verses that I think I've certainly covered this before in the Bible. And I know I've read every bit of it, but I'm going to do it again. But then I find something like this verse that where in the world did that come from? I'm sure I've been over this many, many times. But where did that come from? From God? Have you ever read the Bible too much, Ted? I don't believe any of us have. Sometimes we think we have. Oh boy, this is in our Bible reading. I've got to do that this week. Or I've got to do that today. We read every day, my wife and I. And then we pray together. And we pray over the things that are contained in the, in the scriptures. 
And I've never found that we've gone there in vain. God's always got some jewel, some nugget that he wants us to capture in our hearts, in our minds. And take it and hide it in our heart. One of my uh, favorite scriptures, in fact, my life verse, is thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. The, the opposite of that is don't hide word, the word of God in your heart. And what's going to happen? You're going to sin against God because it's not there. Because you've left it out. Because we've forgotten it. Maybe you don't leave it out, but I do. I've got to have God's word in my heart. And it's got to be pretty fresh. If it's not pretty fresh, I forget it. I guess I have a short span memory. And it just doesn't seem to stick. That's what God wants us to do with his word. To hide it in our heart. So that we don't sin against God. When we read God's word, we've got it fresh in our heart. We're put on guard. We're put on notice. We're aware of what we're supposed to be doing and what we're not supposed to be doing. I mean, really, we know that anyway. What we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. And if we don't, what can we do? We can say, God, would you show me what I'm supposed to do about this situation? And he never lies to us. He always tells us the truth. He always presents to us what we're supposed to do. We have no excuse to say, well, I didn't know that was wrong. I didn't know I was supposed to do that or wasn't supposed to do that. Because God has given us everything we need. Brother J.R. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I was going to have you open the Bible to, to a Bible verse, but I think we all should know it by heart. John 3.16. Can we... Say John 3.16, everybody together. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, so whoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world, His love is overwhelming, His love is unending, His love is more than any kind of love that you can ever experience in this world. He's long-suffering. And I appreciate that Christians get saved and experience an experience that they're so overwhelmed because they, they can't understand how this God could forgive them for everything that they've done. And they get so overly emotional. And I understand that because I know that I don't deserve to be forgiven by God. And He gave His only begotten Son. He gave a, he gave a love that nobody ever here on this earth can give you. But I was speaking to a person this last week. And... Uh, <clears throat> I can say that uh, I got, I got kind of worked up and because God quickened my spirit, I kind of came across, kind of, I did come across uh, pretty um, aggressive. But you got to understand that if you're a Christian and you know the love of God and you experience the love of God, you got to be careful to say that God has unconditional love. Because it says here, whoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So 
God has conditions. If you don't accept his son, Jesus Christ, you won't be with him in eternity. He hates the wicked. He abhors the wicked. We want to put God in a box like we want to overlook everybody's faults. God will overlook your faults and forgive you for your faults only if you come to Him and ask for forgiveness. He is faithful and just to forgive. But it's very dangerous to take the love of God and spread it to the world saying He has unconditional love for you. He has requirements. He has conditions. And that's so important because it's so dangerous to spread that message even out of a Christian. And I understand that a Christian is so overwhelmed with the love of Christ that they feel that the Lord loves everybody, which He does. But He has conditions. He, ha it, he's, he doesn't have unconditional love requirements. And we need to tell the world God loves you, but you have to come to Him. You have to ask forgiveness. You have to turn from your wicked ways. If we, as a body of Christ, aren't careful with this message, yes, God loves everybody, and God wants everybody to come to Jesus Christ and ask for forgiveness. But, a lot of people tell me, well, JR, well, JR, God loves the sinner but hates the sin. But nevertheless, if you die today with your sin, God will send you to hell, not to sin. You will end up in hell. God has conditions on His love. And He's done everything in His power to give you that love and he loves you immensely but he will not put up with you if you reject him and I know it sounds harsh but I got to tell the person if you reject Christ he won't put up with it you would not you would end up in eternity without him and I know that's a hard message to, to preach but the message of unconditional love is a very dangerous message God has conditions, God has requirements, and we need to be fearful whenever we tell somebody, oh, you know, you can, you can come to Christ and He'll forgive you and you can go on and do what you want, when, when you want it, how you want to do it. No, He forgives you to do what He tells you to do, when He tells you to do it, and how He tells you to do it. You're not yours anymore, you belong to Him. And if you love Him, you will obey His commandments. And if you don't, what's the opposite? So, so this message that a lot of Christians are are spewing from their mouth that God will love you, God loves you unconditionally, no matter what. It's a very dangerous because we can lead people to hell with that message. God loves you; He'll forgive you for anything. Well, not for anything not blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. He won't forgive you for that. And He won't forgive you. Jesus said, if you won't forgive, I won't forgive you. And if you're ashamed of me in front of men, I'll be ashamed of you in front of my Father. There's conditions. And there's requirements. He loved you. So why don't you love Him? And I know you feel sometimes overwhelmed of the love that God has because when I stand up here, whenever I stand up in any pulpit, I know I don't deserve to be here. But nevertheless, God has conditions and requirements that we have to meet for to be in eternity with Him. He who endures to the end shall inherit eternal life. He who endures to the end, there's a condition. Not he who quits, not he who just, just, just sits on, you know. He who endures to the end. Do you love him that much? And we are supposed to spread the gospel wherever we go. But be very careful and have the fear of God in you. And you know, whenever this person told me this, 
I got so, it, my spirit jumped up and just said, no, God doesn't have unconditional love. He, he, he has conditions. The only analogy that I can that I can portray is this person that I care about so much. I saw a rattlesnake in their hand and I jumped up and said, drop that rattlesnake right now, drop it. I don't wanna hear nothing, just drop that rattlesnake. Because the person didn't know that it was a rattlesnake and they could bite them and kill them. The message of God has unconditional love is a very dangerous message. And I'm so sorry if I offended somebody, but because that mess is so dangerous, I want a Christian to drop it just like a rattlesnake because it is so dangerous and it's so dangerous to other people because it gives a false narrative about the Lord. Don't add, don't take away from God's word. He will punish the unrighteous and the wicked. So let's, let's make sure we are very careful whenever we present the love of Christ because it's very precious, it's very valuable, and there are conditions. So wherever we go, we need to spread the gospel and how much God loves us and how much God, what he did for us on the cross. But he has conditions. I have no more to say. I'm, I sort of want to say I'm sorry if I offend people. But I don't open my mouth unless God tells me to. And this, God has unconditional love. I understand the concept. I understand the feeling and the overwhelming, you know, overwhelming love of Christ in a Christian's life. But we have to be careful to spread that word because people will take it and run with it and say, I can do what I want to do. I can live the lifestyle I want to live and still go to heaven. There's conditions. If you love me, you obey my commandments. Thank you. So we're going to be talking about you children obeying your parents. So I'm going to read your story today. But before we do, I'm going to give you something. And then, you see, I brought my trash can with me. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit, and then I'm going to give you something to hold. Somehow or other, when we do one bad thing, we always end up doing another and perhaps another. Right? We do one sin and it's easy to do another one and another one. And a sin, Josiah, what is a sin? It's something that's wrong that that's you do. Wrong. It's wrong. And God hates it, right? God hates sin. So it's anything that we do that might displease God. Anything that we do that will stand between us and God. So God tells us in his Bible the things that he wants us to do and he tells us things that he does not want us to do. So as we said, one sin leads to another. And so we have to be very careful or the first thing we know, we'll, we will have done several things that, made, that makes God unhappy. So Josiah, you come here and there's some little... Uh, I want you to pass all these out to all the ones that are down there. Uh, maybe two each for some. Just use them all up. Maybe your mom. Now this is going, these are representing sin. So listen as I read this story to you. As in the case of Johnny that we're going to be learning about, Johnny. He did some things that made God unhappy. So Johnny was just leaving his house to play. 
And his dad said, Johnny, remember what I told you about going over to Wilbur's house? Dad said, Wilbur just isn't the kind of boy with whom I want you to play with. I don't want you to go over there. Okay, Dad, I won't, Johnny said as he walked down the front porch steps and on and out to the sidewalk he went. He was happy as can be. But do you know but do you know what Johnny did? As soon as he got out of sight of his own house, he turned down the street toward Wilbur's house. Johnny had told a lie. So let's start on this end. Now you're gonna drop your link into this trash can. That's Johnny's sin. What did he do first? He told a, does God like lies? No. No, he hates them and he tells us in his Bible he hates them. <clears throat> Not only did he lie, he disobeyed his dad. Another sin. And not only that, he broke one of the Ten Commandments. The one that says, honor thy father and thy mother. Next sin, he dishonored his parents. Johnny had already sinned how many times? Three times. And that was just in a matter of minutes. As soon as Johnny got to Wilbur's house, Wilbur suggested they go over to the park to play. Johnny had been told by his mother not to go to the park without her knowing it. But he didn't take the time to run and ask his mother if he could go. He just went anyway. Johnny disobeyed his mother. Who's next? This made the fourth sin he had committed since he had left home just a short while ago. While the two boys were at the park, they talked with some older boys who used bad words. Well, Johnny knew that the Bible says that we should not use God's name irreverently, but Johnny wanted to be like the other boys, so he talked as they did, even though he knew it was wrong. Johnny sinned again. Oh, oh, you must have put two for one. <laughs> okay, again he sinned. Wilbur and Johnny decided to leave the park and cut through Mr. Patterson's yard. Boy, look at that apple tree, Wilbur exclaimed. These apples sure look good. Well, we can't eat any though, Johnny said. You know, it would be stealing if we took any. Oh, come on, don't be a sissy. Wilbur said as he pulled a nice juicy apple off the tree. They're good. Johnny couldn't stand the temptation. He took an apple too. He picked it up off the ground, but he knew that even this was wrong. He was still taking it without Mr. Patterson's permission. That was stealing another sin. The nice red apple now didn't taste so good to Johnny. In fact, he could hardly swallow it. He wasn't happy at all, and he knew that both his mother and his father would be disappointed in him. He knew that God was disappointed in him too. I'm going home, he blurred, and without any explanation at all, Johnny threw the half-eaten apple away and ran as fast as he could toward home. He was sorry that he had displeased his parents he was sorry that he had displeased God, and Johnny knew that if he had just obeyed his father in the first place, he would never have done all those other things. Yes, yes, one sin leads to another. One, just one tiny sin leads to another. So now we have a chain of sin, don't we? All these. Just because we, we disobeyed once, it led to many other times. Each sin just latched on to the other one before until all the sins put together were just like this black, black chain. 
So we don't want to be like Johnny, do we? We want to obey what God says in his word, and we want to always obey our parents because they know what's best for us. Right? Okay. Now let me read you some scriptures that the Lord says about children obeying. In Exodus 20, 12, Exodus 20, 12 says, Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Hadassi, what does it mean when this verse says that your days may be long upon this land? Do you know what that means? That means if you obey your parents, you'll live a long life. Yes, that's right. Good, very good. Now in Exodus, I mean Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And that's what we talked about. That's the, that's the commandment that promises you'll have a long life if you honor them and obey them. That it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, it even talks to us adults, you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And the third scripture is Colossians 3.20. And it's very much like the others. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. So we want to obey our parents and do what they say because they know, they know, they love you and they want you to obey God because when you get, obey God, it's, it's, it's good. It's, it's very good. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for these children, Dossi and Josiah and the others, Lord, in our flock that aren't here today that are sick. Bless them, God. Help them to obey their parents. And Lord, help their parents. Teach them the right way to lead their children. And when they grow up, Lord, that they will serve you all the days of their life. Bless them, God. Protect them physically protect them spiritually in every way and use them in your service. Thank you for your word that tells us exactly how we're to act, what we're to do in order to lead a life that brings blessings from you. And we thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.